Before we begin our worship service today, first, Elda, thank you so much for providing our music today. Absolutely beautiful. Uh, we want to encourage you to read your emails. Uh, we are communicating with you regularly. However, we are learning that in some cases, less than 50% of those emails are opened. And so you are missing vital communication and information if you're not opening your email. This last week, you should have received an email from the reopening advisory team about the procedures that we have put in place to ensure your health and safety as you begin to enter into in-person worship next Sunday. The, you will receive a pastoral letter by email this week, and you will also receive information about how to register for our Sunday services. Also, we have provided a video that will be posted very soon on you, our YouTube channel. If you have not subscribed, we invite you to do so so that you receive updates as we post them. This video will show you what it will be like to come in to worship and to leave. Also, we wanted to remind you that the church prayer list is provided for you every week. It's in your Friday email that tells you about the worship service, and you will see a link in that email that directs you to the most updated prayer list at that time. Pastor B is away today celebrating a worship service for one of our members' daughters, and so she will not be here. Every week, one of us will be leading the worship service. Uh, the other will be uh, at home, uh, both monitoring the, the online coffee hour and the worship service. Uh, this allows us, from an administrative standpoint, that only one pastor will be in an in-person worship service so that in the unlikely event that uh, there would be uh, some transmission of the virus, the other pastor would be available to offer pastoral care while the pastor who was exposed to the virus is sequestering at home. That protects us and it also helps us care for you. And so we give thanks to God for the opportunity to be together uh, for the opportunity to uh, bring this service into your homes and for those who are helping us in worship today to make that possible. And now, this is a new day in which God's mercies are brand new. And one of our members this morning greeted those mercies in the kingdom of heaven just as dawn was breaking and the sun was coming over the mountains. And so we give thanks to God for the promise of eternal life that is ours because of Jesus Christ and the stark reminder that each new day is an opportunity to glorify him, whether on earth or in heaven. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this new day, for your tremendous grace, your abundant grace, which we do not deserve and cannot earn we give you thanks for the opportunity to worship you without fear. 
We give you thanks for the freedoms that we have, and we ask that we would use those freedoms so that we might use them to serve you and your kingdom. Bless us this week as we go about our lives. Help us, even in the midst of a pandemic, to be serving the world around us in your name. And so bless us as we come together to be strengthened by the hearing of the word of God. Strengthen us so that we might be your witness in this world. And this we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. The Old Testament reading today comes from Exodus 1, 8 through 2, 10. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know G Joseph. He said to his people, Look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them or they will increase, and in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Python and Ramses, for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. The king, of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, of whom one was named Shifra and the other Pua. When you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God they did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwife said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all of his people, every boy that is born to the Hebrews, you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him for three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying, and she took pity on him. 
This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and, and get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. Thanks be to God. The Gospel according to Matthew, the 16th chapter. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the heaven. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. A question that I receive very often is, Pastor, do you believe that the Bible is literally true? So that's a complicated question, and so it requires a complicated answer. First, do I believe it's literal? Well, yes, I do believe that everything that happens in Scripture really happened. Even if it doesn't follow our natural laws of science or physics, if God can create all of this out of nothing, he certainly can make a whale swallow a man and spit him up where he wants the man to go. And so, yes, I believe that the Bible is literal, but I believe it's more than literal because I, mean, I believe that each story means more than the literal words in it. Take that story, for instance, the story of Jonah, where Jesus later on says, just like Jonah spent three days in the belly of a fish, I will spend three days in the grave. And so Scripture often points to Scripture, and there's more beyond the literal words of each story that we read. Do I believe it's true? Well, I wouldn't have chosen this profession if I didn't. Ah, uh, yeah, I believe it's true. I believe it's more than true. I believe it was true for the people at that time, and I believe it is true for every generation that has read those same words throughout history as it is true for us. The Bible... The text comes into our context in new and gorgeous ways. All we have to do is open our eyes to see it. In our scriptures for today, they go back and forth between looking and seeing. It's one thing to look at something, but it's another thing to see, to take in, and to understand. You take this scripture, for instance, here we have a global leader who is afraid and it's not a, a real issue that he's facing, it's an anticipated issue. In the likelihood that these people who are growing in number might turn against us, they might join with another country 
one of our enemies and overthrow us, and they might leave and our free labor will be gone. None of this is a reality. There is no coup. There is no opportunity for the Hebrew people to turn against him. All of this is speculation. And on that speculation, this Pharaoh, this global leader, enters into a series of attacks and oppression because he's afraid. All you have to do is turn on the TV or read any news source and you will see global leaders around the world today doing the exact same thing. This story continues throughout history and history repeats itself in remarkable ways because often we look but do not see. So the Pharaoh decides, well, in order to keep this from happening, we will oppress them. We will make them build things for us that we need or that I need as leader. And then he decides we'll take the midwives and we'll instruct them to kill the children, if it's a male, when they're born so that we can control the population. Now, for those of you who grew up in the church and heard the story of Moses in your Sunday school, this is the part that the Sunday school teachers left out. We didn't hear about this piece because it's awful and it's about the nature, the awful nature of power and how absolute power is corrupted. So he tells these midwives to kill the young male boy Hebrews and they don't do it. Out of fear for God and fear of God in this context, out of love of God and of worship of him, not that they're afraid of God. The Pharaoh finds out that they aren't doing what he asked them to do, and so he calls them in. And here we get an idea that this global leader is wildly unintelligent, especially when it comes to, to how babies are born. So they come to him and they say, oh, Pharaoh, you know, these Hebrew women, they're, they're not like the dainty, intelligent, educated Egyptians. They give birth before we even get there. And so there's a sense of humor in this scripture about the, the quality of this leader and his actions. Now you fast forward from that point and Pharaoh doubles down. He decides that since oppression didn't work and since having the midwives kill the young males didn't work, I will instruct everyone that if a male is born to the Hebrews, that they will throw him into the Nile. You'll see this later on in Pharaoh's story, that every time he is presented with a challenge, he doubles down. So Pharaoh is put aside for a moment, and the story picks up in the house of a priest. A priest and his wife have a child, a beautiful baby boy, a healthy baby boy, and she tries to hide him for three months until she can no longer do it. And then we see a series of faithful acts done by individuals in these stories that are significant for us as we read it. This mother takes her child and does what Pharaoh said must be done. She throws him into the Nile. Pharaoh didn't say, you can't give him a boat. <laughs> so she builds for him a basket and she layers it with bitumen and pitch and we might miss this part of the story, but the people who are hearing it for the first time, they would have understood that this story is drawing our attention to another story about how God saved his people through another life raft that was covered with bitumen and pitch, Noah's Ark. So just as God uses the Ark to save humanity, he will now use this boat, this life raft, with this child to save his people. Also, you may have picked up or not that here is a mother doing the most difficult thing with her child, handing him over to God, not knowing what will happen to him. Fast forward many generations to Mary, who will hand over her child to God, not knowing exactly what will happen to him. And of course, Mary stands as that child is hung on a cross to die and be raised for us. All of these stories are literally true, pointing to one another. 
So you have the faithful act of a mother, Moses' mother, who puts him into the Nile. You have the faithful act of the sister, who we later learn is Miriam, who follows the life raft down the river to see, not to look, to see what will happen to this child. And then you have the faithful act of the servants who bring the child to Pharaoh's daughter and the faithful act of the daughter who asks for the child to be brought. Pharaoh looks at these children as subhuman, not even animals, that he can discard them because he is afraid of what they might do. But his daughter looks at this child, recognizes that this child is one of the Hebrews, and she sees a human being. She sees something to be saved. So in a way, she is defying her father in a most significant way by caring for this child. Now the humor picks back up here because Miriam, Moses' sister, hears Pharaoh say that this must be one of the Hebrew children, and she says, hey, do you want me to get someone to nurse this child? Notice how smart she is. She doesn't say, I'm his sister, I know his mother, why don't I go get him? Because that would set her up in a power struggle and might affect the boy. She says, do you want me to go get someone to nurse this child? She says, yes. And so she goes and gets her mother and brings her back. And the humor of this story, Pharaoh, who wanted to kill this child, ends up paying his mother to nurse the child. And then the child is finally turned over to Pharaoh's daughter after he has grown is what the text says to us and the mother has to hand him over again and we can't imagine what that was like for this mother so what does all this have to do with us anyway all of those faithful acts combined were used by god to save moses and moses was used by god to deliver his people every single person in this story had a role in making God's plan come about. It's the same with us. Every individual decision that we make in our lives is part of God's plan. Now, we make decisions that He would not have us make. I'm talking about the decisions that we make that are right and moral and of of our Christian thoughts and feelings. Those are used by God to glorify Him. And so, we do not know the power of each action that we take. Think of it this way. If you were to wear your mask, I'm wearing a face shield so that I can be understood. But if you were to wear your mask, you do not know if that action actually saves the life of the person who will one day cure cancer. If you wear your mask, you do not know that that action might save the life of the person who will one day come to run this country. You do not know if you are saving a woman's husband or a man's child, someone's spouse or their grandfather. You do not know what that simple action of faith does. And it's not about what is our right under a constitution. It's about what's right in the eyes of God. Because as Christians and as people who follow God, We care for the other as much as we care for ourselves. If we're willing to take that chance for ourselves, that's one thing. But to do that for someone else is an altogether different decision. And I'm afraid many of us don't even think about that when we make that choice. Well, that's just one way in a pandemic that we can protect others. There are many things that we can do. Our individual decisions have cumulative effect. Right now, there are so many people who are hungry and out of work. All of the individuals who give to Lake Christian Ministries enable that ministry to feed them and to provide for them in that time when they are in troubled waters. Like Miriam's sister, accompanying them by looking and seeing their need, we come alongside of them in those troubled waters to help. We have many things that you could do here at the church during the pandemic. 
Trinity Treasures continues to pick up items uh, to be stored and then sold. And you may not recognize that throughout this ministry, from the time an item is picked up to the time it is sold, it touches many people. It touches the person who needed help moving during a time of transition. It helps a person who has a house fire and we provide things for them to furnish their home. It helps the person who can't afford a refrigerator or a stove and so we provide the appliances that help them cook a meal for their family. It helps the person who can't afford things at full price and buy them at our sale. And the money that we make helps us in our ministry and helps us to fund various ministries throughout our community to help the most vulnerable people in our area. And all of that can be done by simply helping us get some items from one house to the church. So if you are able-bodied and not worried about exposure at the extent of others, please consider helping us in that ministry until Stan Sowers. The men who help us out, the men and women who help us out in our uh, church grounds could use someone with a truck to come and pick up mulch, and we could use people to help spread that mulch to keep our grounds during the pandemic. So if you're able-bodied and willing to serve outside, call Al Fusi. There are so many ways that you can serve our community and our church, so many ways that you can come alongside one another during this troubled water time. If you're confused about what you might have to offer, we invite you to call the church or to email Pastor B or me and have a faith conversation about how God can use you right now. And so we pray that like the story of Moses, that all of our individual actions will not only get us through the pandemic, it will get us through the pandemic stronger than we were before. And so let us all pray that God uses us in the same way as these faithful men and women in the story for today. Amen. Your time, talents, prayers, and financial gifts make this ministry possible and carry God's love out into the world. I'd like to invite you now to respond in openness to the many gifts that we have been given. You can give online through the mail or via in-person drop-off uh, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And our offertory hymn for today, um, Elda will play, in Humility by Roland Pritchard. Thank you. 
Thank you, Elder. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks for this new day in which your mercies are brand new, in which there are opportunities before us that we could not see before. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would give us wisdom. We can look over our lives and see the choices that we have made that have led to big transitions, but it is difficult for us to see the impact of small individual choices that we make day after day. And so give us the wisdom to see the power of each choice that we make if we live for your glory. We pray that we would think of these choices as we shop in the grocery store, as we go to the bank, as we engage people during this time who do not treat us in a way that is respectful or kind or courteous. We pray that each small individual choice that we make will further your kingdom, your compassion, and your grace, and thereby change this world so that it looks more like your kingdom than it does today. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would be with people throughout this world who are suffering under oppression. We pray for places in our world where the story of Pharaoh's kingdom is lived out every day. And as the people of God multiplied in the midst of oppression, we pray that your grace and glory and the faithful people will grow, not only in faith, but in numbers. We know that you are a God who delivers, and so we pray that you will deliver them. And so we thank you for the story of Moses and how he delivered your people. We thank you for Jesus, how he delivered us, and we hand our loved ones over into his hands, those who are near and dear to our heart, who are struggling. We pray for Marge, for Alma, for Bonnie, for Georgia, for John, for Chris, for Jan, for Beverly, for Steve and Sandra, Lucille, Dick and Lois, for Paul, for Tom, Sharon, Pat and Vern, Hugh, Anita, Lois, Deborah, for Corey, Gail, Evelyn, for Brian, for Margot, Betty, John, Pete, Kay, for Tony, for Michelle, for Joe, for Bunny and Tom. We pray, Heavenly Father, that your grace would fall upon the Cosby family. We pray that your grace would fall upon the Tyler family. And I pray for that same grace to fall upon my family as we sent my sweet cousin home to be with you, where she suffers no more. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would bless us today in our service of you and that you would open our eyes to see ways that we might love, serve, learn, and grow today. For those celebrating among us, we give thanks for birthdays this week, Patty, Sherry, Gloria, Bill, Woody, and Nancy, for Karen, Ann, Jan, and Sandy, and bless those couples celebrating anniversaries, Chuck and Helen, Dan and Nan, Pete and Bev, Tom and Barb. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, grant in the name of our Lord and Savior, who drew us up out of the water so that we might live with you forever. Amen. Now may the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord's face shine on us with grace and mercy. May the Lord look upon us with favor and give us peace. Amen. Go in peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.